Stargate Voyager. Well, I'm excited to be joined today by researcher and explorer Ben Van Kirkwick from Uncharted X. Derek, mate, thank you so much for having me. Uh, big fan of your work. Uh, it's great to connect. Really great to connect and ditto that. Big fan of your work. I've been following you the last couple of years and man, your YouTube channel is just uh, epic. Uh, loving your video content. I thought we'd start with, uh, selfishly, I'd just like to learn a little bit about your journey. I know my audience would too. Tell us a little bit about your story and how you came to this place of traveling the world and going to Egypt and researching all this lost ancient technology with Uncharted X. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't get into this immediately, I guess. I've had a 20-year career in IT. I uh, worked for Hewlett Packard for, for 20 years, more or less. Um, I was, I, I had a very much, I was a technologist and an architect. I ended up in the, the chief technology office for the networking division, doing a lot of like data center cloud stuff like that. Uh, I was always interested in history. My mother was a history teacher. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, I almost went that way at university, but you know, I mean, I decided that it'd be better to, to go and make some money and you know, do that type of thing. And I was, I'm very interested in the computer side of, and technology side as well. But I maintained that interest, and and I think it's a it's a similar story to a lot of people, and I I always credit him with uh, getting me into this 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 field to this depth. It's, it was Graham Hancock, so it was, I think I'd, I I'd read a couple of his books, and then I saw his very first appearance on on the Joe Rogan Experience, uh, and that just kind of really opened my eyes to a little bit more depth about some of the things he was saying. It, it exposed me to some of his work around consciousness, uh, and psychedelics, things like that, and so. You know, you. I guess you go through. You when you start to explore those avenues in your own life, you can have a, a shift in priorities and sort of figure out a little bit more about what's uh, what's important to you. And certainly that happened to me. But then I, I was following Graham, and and I was. It was like 2012 or thereabouts, 2013, and he threw out a, a tweet that said, "Hey, I'm I'm going to Peru and Bolivia, to research his his next book, which was at the time Magicians of the Gods, the follow up to Fingerprints of the Gods, and." And I jumped on it straight away. So, so I uh, it was like I think it was October of 2013. I had the chance to travel through Peru and Bolivia with like you know 25 other people and Graham and Brian Forrester was there as well, and uh, and that sort of kicked it off for me. I mean, I think two years later, 2015, I, I Graham went to Egypt. This was the uh, some people may be aware of this, but the sort of the infamous debate with with Zahi. This is the tour that was set up around that. Uh, event i was in the room for that little um so-called debate and and all of the the things that happened there but yeah and that was my first trip to egypt in 2015 and that was it, at the back end of that i, I thought you yeah, know i've got a i've got a i'm just I'm so fascinated by this i've been taking more and more time off from work to travel and visit sites and i i kind of saw looking at youtube and and reading all these books that there was an opportunity for some what i would call like high quality footage and and a fresh look at a lot of these sites that incorporates a lot of the ideas that are buried in these books. Like if, if people are into this topic, like a lot of the really interesting stuff is buried in these books. But at the time, there wasn't there wasn't a real exposure to that. Uh, I guess in that new media form on on YouTube and in these you know the sort of mini documentaries, and it coincided with the rise of um, you know high quality consumer grade sort of stabilized 4K video equipment. So. You know, I, it was a, at that time there was a real lack of high quality footage on these sites that was easily available. So that's what I did. I mean, just took the took the gamble and and uh, decided to to take a couple of years off off work in IT to to go pursue that and travel and and build up a a library of footage, which is what I did. And uh, I kind of I worked with a, a partner for a while. We had another channel. Didn't it didn't work out in the end? And then I I sort of reevaluated and thought about what I was going to do and I thought well I haven't said what I want to say I haven't I haven't created uh, the content I want to make and you know do the things that I want to do so I put together the whole just uncharted x branding and, and page and then and then sort of dived in and started from there and thankfully it it it, it grew well people seem to respond well to it and uh, I've kind of been writing the uh <laughs> the, the 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 crazy world that is that is uh you know being a youtuber ever since and uh it's been yeah i i, I love it I, I wouldn't trade it for anything so you witness this debate with <laughs> zawi yeah is there anything you can tell us a little bit more about that as you experienced it was there like a moment where it was like graham really uh took him to the woodshed or was it just respect on both sides and just asking questions 
Well, so there was, it was definitely, I mean, Graham, uh, in the room, it was certainly on Graham's side, pretty respectful. Zahi, you could tell, in my opinion, and, and so the, the famous part of that is, and, and a lot of this is, there's a couple of sec segments of this that are filmed. They're on YouTube. You can find them if you like, if you t search for like Graham Hancock, Zahi was. There was a, a moment before the lectures had started, there was only a few people in the room when uh, you know Graham's flipping through his slides and um, and I, I think a, a picture of Robert Boval appeared in one of Graham's slides. It's the Orion correlation at the Great Pyramids and you know I think it's not unknown that, that Zahi really doesn't like Robert Boval. He's had an issue with him for many years. Um, it wasn't always that way. In fact, you can go back and find I've, I've got a picture of you know Robert Boval, John Anthony West, Graham Hancock, Zahi was like arm in arm in front of the Sphinx at one point. They, those guys have worked together. Uh, uh, and were friendly at one point, but I'm not sure what happened. But anyway, so Zahi kind of flipped out, and this is all on 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 uh, on YouTube if people want to see it. But uh, you know, Graham talked about it after the trip too, quite a bit. But yeah, it was it was it was unfortunate. I I honestly think that he didn't want to be there. He didn't want. He probably didn't want to debate. He had, probably had no intention of debating. He he initially said he was just going to leave. He wasn't going to do anything. Uh, and and then settled on the fact. Well, he said, you know, I'm, I'll give. I'm not going to watch your presentation, but I'll come in and give my presentation. Then I'll take some questions. So that happened. Graham did a fantastic job. Uh, his presentation was uh, as if like a, a was set up for a, a debate. He he addressed a lot of these topics head on. Uh, Zahi gave his presentation, which wasn't quite the same thing. I think it was his stock standard kind of. Here's me with you know. Um, presidents of the United States and royalty and this is these stories and you know this is I'm I'm Batman and I I caught the robbers that that robbed something from the you know the Egypt museum the Cairo museum during the uh the Arab Spring and the revolution so he told this story and he just did his overall thing and then there was a few questions afterwards and and some of those were quite telling too I, I remember there's a good and again this is on YouTube if people want to find it uh he was asked about Gobekli Tepe he wasn't aware of that site didn't 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 uh, see that it had any relevance whatsoever to the story of of civilization in Egypt. Uh, also, famously at that point, it's a sound clip that I use quite often. Just he sort of, you know, hit the table and said, you know, I don't believe in radar. Like he, he, as if I've never found anything with ground penetrating radar. It doesn't that doesn't work or whatever. Um, but yes, yeah, so it was an interesting. It was a really dramatic kind of end to the to the two weeks we had. We we were with Graham for two weeks, and then we had we had one day with Zahi. We we went into the the Sphinx early that morning. Uh, he gave his talk, I guess, in, in the Sphinx enclosure, and then we had the debate that evening. But the funny thing about that was that after all this went down, we we're at the Mina House, this beautiful resort that's right at the foot, almost at the foot of the Great Pyramid. Um, and in the middle of the night, uh, everyone that had attended that debate had had an excerpt that was written from a, a book that he was working on with Mark Lehner, uh, the whole the Pyramidiot sort of section of it. And it's I still have it here. It's in a little binder, but it's like a, a chapter from that book that that he must have had printed. Said everybody needs to to read this and have so everyone at their room had this had this little little um, little uh, little pamphlet of, of a chapter from his book sort of shoved under the door, and it was kind of a weird way for it for it to end. But it. As far as I was concerned, I mean, he, you know, it, it's it's sad. I talked to Graham. I was the only one to interview him last year, and you know, I think he he did express a, a few regrets around how that worked out. And you know, it's it's sad that there hasn't been real, like, legitimate debate and and cord, you know, cordial sort of civil debate in this space because I think it's what we really need. Uh, it's all you know. These, these things make the news when they they blow up, but it, you can see the reaction to Hancock's work now with ancient apocalypse i mean it's just he's getting all this vitriol spewed at him and there's there's a real lack of actual civil debate trying to address the specific topics that are in this field that are in this alternative view on history but yeah there was it was a real interesting experience and and i do remember my my there's there was a few people there and my, my mother's kind of in this crowd where you have this impression of zahi and because he's a charming guy on TV, you know, he's the world world's most famous Egyptologist. He wears his hat, he's got his clothing line. And, you know, you have this impression of him from 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 that footage and, and the stuff he's done on TV. But I know there was a few people that were shocked to see kind of the, the reaction that, that he gave and, and how he handled himself in that debate. Um so yeah, I think Graham came out uh, really well on, on on the back of that. But it was it was a very much a formational thing for me to go, all right, there's there's definitely something here. Uh, and, and a lot of these topics need more exploration, more depth and, and more research.
how exciting has it been to have, you know, this really, it seems like the first ever, again, alternative history documentary go mainstream. I mean, where it's a, a premier net Netflix show, yeah. obviously, like you referenced, there's so much vitriol and media coming against Graham Hancock and you, we see it on Twitter, but I mean, yeah. I've never had so many people that really aren't into this stuff messaging me. Have you seen ancient apocalypse? What do you think? Like to me, it, it shows there is a mass awakening really in large part because of the show. How, how cool has that been for you as somebody who's leading also leading the charge in the alternative history world? It's been great. I mean, I've, I was, yeah, it's a fantastic show. I, I, I applaud Graham for, uh, for persevering and, and getting it done and making it happen. I, I think I, I kind of knew it was happening for a little while before it came out. It was a big, you know, he was keeping it on the down low for quite a while. Uh, for the, I think like the last, the last couple of years while he was filming it, uh, as some people know, he's had some issues. Like he got banned from Egypt, the serpent man, people banned him from coming in with his alternative ideas and filming. Uh, but it's, I think it's, I think it's great. And as you said, like it's, it is, and it's certainly something that I've seen even on the YouTube side, it does seem to be a lot more people um, becoming aware of some of the issues that, that really do surround the earliest parts and the, 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 the history, like the origins of human civilization and this idea that, you know, maybe we're not the only, this might not be the only time where we've risen to what you might call an advanced civilization. It's, it's, it, it seems quite likely and the evidence is certainly pointing in the direction that it's happened before. Certainly that's the, the space that I focus on, but it's, yeah, it's it's fantastic that it's getting the eyeballs that it is. Uh, the the whole vitriol side of it and, and the it became politicized. I think what happened. I mean, three years ago, he was Graham was attacked by um, several mainstream academics in the the, the uh, Society of American Archaeology journal. They dedicated twenty seven pages of their journal to attacking him, and I did a whole deconstruct of it on a live stream. But three years ago, and the fun, and even then, I was calling it back like this is this is political. Like they're calling him a white supremacist and a racist, which is the most nonsense terms if you know the man. And he doesn't ever mention these sort of things in in any of his work. But that's it's kind. Of, I, I consider it kind of like almost liberal dog whistling terms that are being thrown at him, trying to rally a you know. And he gets compelled. Oh, it's ancient aliens. It's it's, it's 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 a it's a collection of ad hominems and logical fallacies and association fallacies. And the funny thing is, it's you, tr you fast forward three years to now, and it's exactly the same arguments being made by exactly the same people uh, spewing the same kind of dog whistles at him. And what happened was, in my opinion, is that you know as soon as you see the previews for it, and you have guys like Joe Rogan or Jordan Peterson in in the in the clip, which I, th I think they were, then that triggers to s what you might consider the the left a little bit. And so you have some left-wing publications like The Guardian, and they, they'll go out looking for the opposition to it, and that amplifies that that same argument. And they get you know guys like John Hoops and Jason Covalito, these the same guys that that were saying the same thing for for years now. Uh, they get their message gets amplified, but but ultimately, I mean, whatever. It's the nature of the internet, right? It, it brings more eyeballs to the whole thing, and I think they've made themselves look a little silly by saying things like well how is this is the most dangerous show on netflix how has this been allowed as if you know you, you it shouldn't be allowed somehow it's the, the, some of the articles that were written about this are are utterly ridiculous um but yeah it's 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 generated a lot of interest in the space which has been been great and uh i think it will will continue to do that i i, I think there's a, a lot of depth to a lot of these these topics uh, and a lot of different directions you can go. In particular, you know, the thing Graham talks a lot about with the apocalypse side is obviously the Younger Dryas. We know now that that true cataclysm happened on this planet not that long ago. It's associated with a, uh, you know, an extinction event that happened and humans lived through it and it would have been an absolute civilization ender. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's there's just a lot more to be done here. And I hope it stirs up a lot more legitimate debate legitimate research and even you know over time hopefully starts to change the um what you might call the mainstream narrative it's still this whole space is still somewhat controlled by acad academia if you like it's still the, the official narrative of history it hasn't changed much in 100 years uh in terms of civilization has is is more or less in the hands of of the academic um establishment that, that the guys in professors and the people that write the textbooks and that teach the courses in, in universities and, and whatnot 
but there's a lot of different vectors that are coming at that now and a lot of different people have voices that are being recognized and i think that's one of the one of the issues that i think some of these people find quite threatening like the nature of the discourses has shifted uh people other people me whatever the youtubers and authors they can they can they can gain a platform and they can have a voice and they can start to convince people and i think that's threatening but i think I, I i do have some hope on this front i mean i've been contacted by lots of students and people that are in you know archaeology courses that, that the people that will be the academics of tomorrow and i think they're being forced to deal with some of these questions and issues and topics that that really show that well there's actually some vectors that should be affecting history so i, I have hope that over time you know will this whole field might become a bit more open-minded on the academic side and and we'll be able to embrace some of these um new topics and really factor them into what our picture of history is. Well said. So you just got back from Egypt. It sounds like you've been there several times. <laughs> um, was there um, was there an aha moment or something you saw this time that you never saw before? Maybe it was at a site. Uh, maybe it was, you know, some kind of revelation or new idea, new theory, anything like that you want to share to start out with? Sure. Yeah. Well, so I I went twice this year. I was there in October and then again in November. Uh, so I spent a fair bit of time in Egypt, and I did. I had um, I had absolutely in October and then in on in November. There was. I mean, we we hit a lot of sites. Uh, for me, one of the the best things that I've managed to do in the last couple of years, and the first time I did this was was twenty twenty one. Uh, was was getting down beneath the step pyramid to where they they of Josa at Saqqara. And this is where they found, you know, forty to fifty thousand of these of these stone vases. The phase, the, the the hard stone vases have always fascinated me, and they're to me they're really a smoking gun uh, that unlocks kind of the story of of advanced technology deep in the past. Because you can point at lots of other aspects of Egyptian um, artifacts and architecture, and some of them get attributed to like New Kingdom and later periods, and they're sort of spread out across the civilization, but not the jars. The, the jars and vases are generally said to have come from the first and second dynasty, even though we have, and this is mainstream uh, evidence of them going back to as, as far as like 15,000 BC. Uh, so well into like Mesolithic uh, times, even, even, even uh, Neolithic sort of times in uh, in Egypt but then they disappear they sort of stop right there and it's you know Joseph hoovered them all up and he had them buried with him and even in in the museum at Saqqara they talk about it being uh you know that that he most of these were inherited heirlooms from earlier times they actually say that on one of the displays but after that period they pretty much disappear from the the narrative and what you get are these handmade alabaster vessels which developed in a high art form they're beautiful but it's they're nothing technologically speaking compared to you know vases made from from schist or corundum or uh, or, or porphyry and, and granite and things that are much much harder and they display much more precision and 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 machining than these handmade alabaster vessels so getting down beneath the step pyramid being able to handle some of these fragments that are still down there you you can actually touch them feel them measure them uh examine them you, you can't do any of that in in museums unfortunately everything's locked up behind cases you're not allowed to touch uh, all of these these objects. So that's been a real revelation, and I've I've got some content out out, out there on that. But this year in particular, and and it was the subject of my last video. There was what I would call some some real um, incontrovertible evidence of of advanced machining. I mean, there's lots of different flavors of of that you can say, but this one was in particular something that was then confirmed by a, a real master stonemason um, artist stone worker. Uh, who was with us on the tour and it was something i kind of realized like yeah this is this is really really it's impossible to explain with hand tools and this is the this is the there's that box on elephantine island like it's this it's a shrine i guess it's got a it's got a pyramid like top uh it's got tube drills in it it's this giant big single piece granite box it's probably the most famous and well-known artifact at elephantine island but it has this edging this cornice this bull nose thing that runs around it and on one side of it um, it's it's perfect like a semicircle, right? It's it's you know maybe it's a, a two inches across, but it's just semicircle edging that runs around it. All part of the single piece box, but on one side of the box, halfway down, where this thing runs around the edge of it, it's it's not finished, and it's it's like that. It you can see where the polishing has and the the, the polishing to give it that round shape ends, and then for a meter or so of this of this bullnose, 
it's faceted like faceted like you would think of a gemstone being faceted these flat planes it has these straight flat planes about nine of them around this semicircular shape and and it's we know that it's not finished right so this isn't the intended finished shape for this bull nose this is the result of machining on the stone this is the result of whatever tool was roughing out the stone to create that shape and then they would polish it out and for whatever reason they never finished it it kind of shows the value of, of unfinished work um lots of examples of this across egypt it's almost more valuable than seeing finished work but you know we had this um uh, Almer Allen with us, who's who's a really well-known artist in, in the art world, works in stone, billionaires and Zuckerberg and these guys buy his work. But he looked at this and, and in the same way he looked at the vases beneath the step pyramid and the fragments and said, there's just no way. Like this isn't, it's just 100% 100, 100 the result of, of machine tools and, and you just can't do this work by hand. So yeah, he um, that was a real revelation to me. I've been looking at this thing for a few years and not really connecting the dots between like well this is unfinished work these flat planes can't be done with hand chisels they must have been done with some form of rotating tool that was machine guided that was very precisely guided to create these these straight facets and it's just yeah it's those types of things that are it's just like you can't it becomes very difficult to argue i think that this was done with pounding stones and chisels or whatever uh you know and, and just grinding because the, the evidence isn't there it's just it's something else the only way you can achieve it is with these machine tools so that for me was 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 huge but yeah every time i go to egypt though it's, you, you learn something new i always in every site you revisit you see little details it's one of the benefits of going back there several times you keep you keep getting to you think about stuff after you come back and then you go back and look at it closer and learn a little more um yeah it's it, it was those were fantastic trips yeah i really enjoyed your latest uh youtube video um Thank you. About uh, evidence of advanced machining on Elephant Island, Elephantine Island. I got to see this box, yeah, this last February when I was there. And so incredible to walk up to this multi ton rose granite box, yeah. or like you said, a lot of people call it a shrine, and just see the, the precision work, 90 degree corners. As you say, inset edges, tube drill holes tube on drills. the inside of it, corners. Yeah. That's, and, a, that's a challenge in its own. Yeah, and your video is just perfect because you're so close up to these holes. I like how you made the point that uh, it's not the final appearance for the edging. Right. And that you said it was like the signature of the tool that did the shaping. Yep. It's it's the mark left by the machining process. I know we're theorizing here, but when you kind of consider what this ancient tool might have looked like, uh, do you have any anything like that you can share? Well, and it is speculation. Like I don't know, um, but to my mind, and discussing it with people that that uh, and like guys like Almer Allen who was there, uh, who who has literally worked in stone with both hand tools, machine tools, and then later robotics, um, and you know these like CNC uh, machines, real expert. I, I'm convinced that, that that particular thing was created by something that was rotating. It had to be rotating to create these facets, and then be guided. The trick is. You have two problems. You have to have something that can that can make that can can eat away at stone. I mean, that's that's a challenge in its stone when you're talking about granite. Uh, not easy to do. People people make a lot of comparisons to the wood, but it's like there's not, there's a there's a world of difference between working in wood and working in granite. Uh, you know, marble and and alabaster and stuff like that. It's much softer and, and much easier. But granite's like why you almost question why are they doing this in granite? It's like that one of the hardest things to work in material wise. But to me, there's there's two things with it. It has to be something that's rotating in a tooltip that's wide enough to create these small facets, but it has to be very precisely guided. So almost machine guided, or or there's a jig involved, like something that creates it and, and runs it along, you know, keeps it very straight, because that's the thing. These facets aren't wobbling and all over the place. They're straight for like a meter. So in my mind, it's it's either a tool that that makes a facet per like per pass almost, or it could be something more complex where it was like, well, this is the bullnose tool and we slap it in here and it just creates that whole thing in one part. They might've had like nine, several different faces that were rotating to create that shape. And then after that, they come in with the, whatever tool it is that, that polishes it down or whatever technique that it is to polish it down to make it semicircular and get rid of those facets. So that's, that's what I think something like that may look at but it's very difficult to say we don't know um i don't i mean when it comes to like the speculation about how some of this stuff was done or even what it was for 
because uh, I firmly believe that a lot of these old kingdom sites and things like the boxes and the Serapium were functional. There must have been a purpose for them. I don't think they're everything ceremonial. It's it it strays into that realm of well, you know, it's we we have to we're almost forced to look at this stuff through the lens of our own technology, through our own evolution and science. And for sure, we know that there's stuff that's outside of that lens of that viewpoint, right? We're going to know more about science and the world and the nature of everything in 10 years and 100 years in a thousand years we'll know more so we know there's stuff outside the realms of our understanding today and i i do believe that that some of these things perhaps some of the techniques and, and perhaps some of the functions of these sites and objects may exist outside those those realms of understanding so it becomes quite difficult to to really speculate all i can do all we, we tend to look at this and go well how would we do it today uh how would we solve this problem and that that's not necessarily the way it was done, I think, back then or, or what it was for. You know, we had this electromechanical approach to problem solving and that may well be have other fundamental directions of technology that might have been explored by the ancients in the past and that, that don't that we haven't quite got there yet or we're only beginning to explore stuff, you know, resonance and frequency stuff or or using organic materials in the way that they did uh obviously didn't seem to have the need to make composite materials um those sort of things so i don't uh, yeah I, I i don't know but if i was to guess i'd say it was some sort of rotating tool that 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 was very precisely guided and that's the that's the challenge and we see that we see that in a lot of objects we, you have to have this you have to have this precision this guiding this crazy precision and it's really well um exemplified by stuff things like the 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 faces of the giant statues at luxor all the the head jets the the crowns the patients and the head jets just the pure symmetry that's in those uh from left to right and it was exemplified really well by christopher dunn in his work uh um advanced lost technologies of ancient egypt and because i you often get the question well you know if you know, enough time and these artists work on it and look at what michelangelo did with david and i agree that's spectacular but a it's in marble and b it's not symmetrical it's very human, um, but this this pure symmetry that you get in complex objects from left to right is isn't something that's really achievable by hand, and it's and it seems to have been stamped out again and again and again, almost like there was a template, almost like there was a machine making it. And I think that's the most logical explanation for what we see, because that type of symmetry is 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 evidence for some seriously advanced technology and and capability to to be able to do that it's not you don't really do it by accident and you don't really it's it's almost impossible i would imagine to achieve by hand doing things like that in granite it's like you know one mistake and it's you're done um but they seem to have had a lot of confidence in their ability to execute this stuff in, in single pieces of stone and it's just astonishing you know we had talked about uh zawi Hawes at the top and you know these egyptologists basically they tell us and you know I mean, I grew up believing before I really got into a lot of this alternative research that, yeah, everything you see in Egypt was built by the dynastic Egyptians, like you point out, I point out. And if you're listening and you don't um, know, the dynastic Egyptians of about 3000 BC, they're the mm -hmm. ones that were told, create everything in Egypt, everything Ben's talking about, this incredible precision box in uh, on Elephantine Island, that the pyramids were made as tombs. Um, but like you, like you point out in your a lot of your videos, when you look at the archaeological record, the dynastic Egyptians had uh, certain tools, right? Yeah. They had copper tools and even some iron tools, right? Which later on, yep. Later on, on the Mohs scale of hardness, rank between three and four, I think, or so, around there. And yeah, this, like copper is the three, bronze might be a four, steel, iron's like a five, steel can be five and a half, six ish, but still less than granite and certainly some of the other stones they used right so how were they precision crafting these uh eight plus on the most scale hardness granite whether it's statues or uh, you mentioned these vessels stone vessels mm -hmm. these statues um these boxes and i definitely want to talk to you about the statues yep because that was that was my biggest takeaway in this last egypt trip i mean I knew the pyramids weren't built as tombs, uh, but I had never really thought a whole lot about statues uh, until we got to some of these sites and uh, our guide Muhammad Ibrahim was pointing out like that 1,000 ton statue. Oh, yeah. And so I know you recently did a video on this as well. 
And I want you just to talk to us about these ancient, whether it's the precision statues or just colossal statues, yeah, which yeah, are yeah. precision too. Yep. One, it sounds like you lean like me that these may have been created way before the dynastic Egyptians. So, I mean, right there, we're just... This is mind blowing to consider that these we might be looking at depictions of the the earlier civilization. Yep. And then just tell us about this one thousand ton statue and what what okay. uh, is craziest to you about the precision, and then like the symbols you even see on like the shoulders or the base of that one. Yeah. So there's a lot a lot to unpack there. So I I would preface this by going back and saying yet yeah, so you're right in that. In the archaeological record, we have we have you know copper tools, bronze tools, pounding stones, flint chisels, stuff like that, and that's all we found. Now, when I look at ancient Egypt, and this this, this spreads across architecture, but also categories of artifacts, the like columns, boxes, statues, slabs, vessels. You, you I, I'm I'm honing in on this this concept of a, what I would call a tale of two industries, because as you said. Ancient Egypt ran from more or less just after 3000 BC up until around um, like 30, I think it was 30 BC when Cleopatra committed suicide. That was officially the end of it. There's, there is, there's a lot of time for renovation, rework existing on these sites. We know they, they did that. They obviously built a lot of stuff. Um, you know, they, they were an amazing civilization. But when you look closely at the artifacts and what we see, you, you see two classes of objects. You see stuff that absolutely matches the tools and techniques that we have in the archaeological record. Much rougher work, uh, definitely handmade statues, boxes, columns, things like this. But then you have this other class of objects, things like the box on Alphatine Island, some of the statues. Uh, and I would put anything that's above, say, 200, 250 tons uh, into this category just from a logistics perspective because I don't believe that they had the capability to shift loads that large. Um, or stuff like the Serapian boxes, like moving them in underground. I think you could up above ground, they're probably capable of doing stuff at 150 tons with the, because they didn't use pulleys, you know, these wooden sleds and, and levers and human horsepower and ropes. But in those tight spaces, it's a different story. So you have all these, you have these two categories of, of artifacts. Uh, one that's explainable by the, the tools that we have in the record and one that really isn't, that requires something else. And, you know, I do, I do think that that a lot of this stuff, the the advanced stuff, is most likely inherited because we do see it at the very earliest parts of the Egyptian civilization. The vases, uh, the big single piece granite columns, the the palm shaped columns you see them at Abu Sia, at Saqqara, uh, and I think I think you also see them in places like Luxor and Karnak, and I think that those temples were rebuilt in the New Kingdom in the 19th dynasty by Ramses around some of that original granite infrastructure, like with the, the obelisks. And yeah, I, so I would include statues in that as well. And so you mentioned the, the thousand ton statue. There's actually several of them. Uh, we have evidence for at least three or four that I know of. Uh, there is the one at um, the Ramesseum, the, probably the, the best known one is the, it's fallen over. You still see that like the the shoulder and the head and it's the pedestal still there just the pedestal that thing sits on is not less than 460 tons single piece block of granite uh i paste it out and you can calculate kind of the the mass of it roughly it's insane and we see them at at uh at karnak there's evidence for a, at least a thousand ton uh single piece statue there's a giant hand and thumb and they've kind of put most of the arm together on the ground it's all these fragmented pieces of it all over the place and that one's actually made from an even harder material than granite. It's a conglomerate quartzite, which includes huge chunks of flint, and that's an eight on the most scale. Like working, they used flint to cut the to cut granite. You know, it's it's when you're making it out of flint and you're polishing these surfaces and making it, it's, it's mind-bendingly difficult. And in these conglomerate materials where you go from softer to harder, it's it's much more difficult than, than working in something as even as difficult as granite. And then for me, probably one of the most impressive um, examples of a thousand ton statue is what's left at Tanis. There's not much of it left. There's a foot. And then this foot is about the same size as the foot of the Statue of Liberty. So if you're looking for like a scale comparison, how big the statue likely was, it's probably about the same size as the Statue of Liberty, but carved from a single piece of granite. And the crazy thing about it being in Tanis is that that's up in the north in the delta. That's more than a thousand miles from Aswan, from the source of that material of that stone so at some point they there was 
what could have been 12 or 1500 tons of single piece granite moved more than a thousand miles uh, and then put up there in the delta. And the river doesn't run right to town. It's like there's, you're not just shipping it on a boat. There's a lot more involved. Um, so there's, you know, I, that stuff is, is utterly remarkable. And as you said, there's, there's, a, there's a high degree of precision. And I'd love to see more of them, more of these statues analyzed. Uh, I do think that, that some of them were worked on. Some of them may have been replicated by the dynastic Egyptians. I mean, they became very capable over time of working in stone. You look real close at the statues at Luxor, there is differences in, in, in precision and in sort of cleanness of, of what things are. So I don't think every statue at Luxor is pre-dynastic, but, but certainly several of them are, and, and in particular the ones that have been analysed and shown things like this perfect symmetry. You, you see a couple of, couple of signs. One, for me, we talked about symmetry. That's one. The other one is you see repeated radius cuts. Like you see, you see the same radius being employed in different parts of uh, the face and the, and the curves in the, in the objects. It's kind of difficult to analyze given they're all three dimensions. It's not just like a flat plane. They're three-dimensional um, faces. But just that alone is a sign that, okay, this, you have to imagine like some giant CNC machine with the same tool that's making cuts in different places because that's how, you know, the, the, the algorithm made it, made it go. But that's, that in itself is, is kind of a sign of some pretty seriously advanced tool use. But yeah, so what's interesting about the statues are is there's not a huge argument to be made that they're functional. Like they're, they're clearly representational. Like they're not, they don't have a function other than as a marker, perhaps. Like they could have been used to mark a location. But yeah, I, I think they were in, they were, they, I think several of them, and particularly the, the big ones, were most likely inherited. And what's interesting about that is, is, as you said, it seems to be depictions of the builder culture, whatever the civilization, Atlant, whoever you want to call them, that came before the dynastic civilization. And, you know, let's not forget the Egyptians themselves recognized that they called themselves a legacy civilization they traced their own history back some thirty six thousand years uh and i think what what a better explanation because i get the question what often it's like well if the statues if you think the statues are so old then how come they look like the dynastic egyptians i actually think it's the other way around right i think that 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 they if you are a culture that comes out of nowhere you, you, in the old kingdom boom we're here and we're building we've got these pyramids we've got these statues these are our these are gods these are your ancestors your gods they likely they didn't start from nothing they came from with images uh of of their gods they came with probably culture religion perhaps maybe even language and that's where it starts because one thing that's consistent if you go and look at all the, the temples the beautiful te temple of like seti the first and all of the artwork that's undoubtedly dynastic there's something that doesn't change throughout the ages. You you always see these pharaohs and rulers being depicted as being amongst the gods. They're always in there, and he's, he's, you're with Isis, or you're with Horus, or you're with Amun. And the, you know, the gods are giving them the gifts of life and, and stability and power, the the ankh, the wasp, the, the jed pillar, like all these symbols. And that seems really consistent. So they always pictured themselves as being amongst the gods. And so they have these representations of that iconic look. So they created themselves in these images of, of these gods that were gods to them. I think a lot of that iconography and that, that look of what we associate with dynastic Egypt may well be very old, very much older. And they're, they're inheriting that. So it's almost a form of like a cargo cult. You know, it's, it's like they're trying to gain significance through ceremony and through, um, you know, just, 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 uh, uh, what would you call it like significance like by creating these ceremonies and trying to take some of that power and, and bring it upon themselves and, and make themselves seem godlike in their own times and this you know this extends you know you have thousands of years of this and then you you do get like really huge powerful empires like in the 19th dynasty with you know Seti the first Ramses the second Meren Patar these guys that are that are notorious for claiming these things and and you mean everything today we consider Ramses the second to be the most powerful pharaoh and the biggest one the best one because his name's on everything um and we don't really it's not really talked about as much in these days but it certainly was in Flinders Petrie's time and when they were really there was a lot of that you know really primary Egyptolo Egyptological research going on where they know that he was claiming older objects like there's so many examples of it where he's overriding glyphs he's overriding the names 
he's chiseling his name into statues into slabs into obelisks and and you know over the top of features i i, I get into it in a bunch of my my videos and yet the science of egyptology pretty much depends on that writing to then date and relate the object and if not the object the whole site itself into the story of history so it's kind of like this faulty premise for how we date and relate a lot of these objects they could potentially be far older than that but this guy just came along later on and chiseled his name deeply into it um and he would do it really deeply because he knew that somebody after him would probably try and do the same thing to him which they did uh, and there's a bunch of objects like statues uh, at Luxor, for example, that have the names of two or three different rulers on them. So how do we know who did what first or if this thing was here before them or not? We don't. Um, but it seems we we have lots and lots of evidence that they were recycling and renaming and claiming these artifacts for themselves. Uh, I assume as a, you know, it's just the arrogance and the power of being a king in a really powerful time like the 19th dynasty. I mean, they had tons of resources and power and money to do that stuff he did embark on these huge building projects ramsey's supposedly built uh you know karnak and Luxor and all those beautiful sandstone hyperstyle halls I, I think that's all dynastic work but i think it was built around a core of pre-existing granite work and that's there's lots of evidence for that on those sites and those are topics that i want to get into uh in future future videos yeah let's end with talking about um kind of resonance and harmonics you know you mentioned chris dunn who basically mm -hmm. concludes in his books that the great pyramid must have been you know originally built to provide a, a highly technical society with energy like this holistic energy device mm -hmm. that's harmonically coupled with the earth tell us kind of your thoughts on that side of things when it comes you've been to egypt many times now you've been inside the pyramids just anything energy harmonics give us your theories on that it's well it's it's a it's a interesting feel. I, and i look forward to more serious research being done uh into it i i, I do think there is something there's something there like I, I don't know i mean look you can get into a water drop like a water tank and and it'll resonate like lots of concrete rooms will resonate at certain frequencies so but there are a, a few specific spots in in uh particularly the giza plateau and in the pyramid that have just a remarkable resonance to them and it does seem likely and as you said chris dunn's theory does does rely on you know he's he talks about the grand gallery housing these series of heimholz resonators and that's part of the the whole theory about that giza power plant now chris is working i'm close with chris as well and he's working uh on a follow-up to that book uh based on a lot of the new information that's come out with the scan pyramids project and i very much look forward to to seeing his findings on that um but yeah i I, I would go back and say that I, I absolutely think that it was functional. I do think that the, the best explanation for the Great Pyramid at the moment is is Chris Dunn's Giza power plant theory because it does explain every aspect of the pyramid. And he used it to correctly predict what was behind Gatenbrink's door, which is the the little slab at the end of the the, uh, the shafts or the northern shaft from the, the Queen's chamber. Um which was remarkable and he based on his theory he predicted what would they would find and that's exactly what they've like a void and another and another little door uh which is what they found when they drilled through it um but i'm not i think that's the best explanation for it but i'm not saying i'm not really convinced that that is the full explanation for it i and and i'm and i i do think that that resonance has something to do with it and you know another thing that he gets into and and sort of speculates in, on in his book is the use of things like ultrasonic drilling and tools that use resonance to help work the stone and that's certainly uh, a plausible aspect we use some of those tools and techniques today we're starting to use them in the drilling industry we do use ultrasonic drilling rigs uh to to do jewelry but also to do larger larger form uh bore drills and things like that to to go through materials so resonance seems to have been a something that was very familiar to the builder culture whoever that was um and it, I think it was definitely a, a tool uh, in their toolbox. But I, yeah, in, in terms of how it all worked or what it does, I, I don't know. I, I do hope that we do more significant, serious research into into the nature of some of that. And um, the more the more we do along those lines, the better. Because I think we 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 have if we my big problem with I guess the mainstream's approach to just shutting down these arguments and saying this is all nonsense. We know what happened. It was a tomb, you know, case closed. Is that it's it's frustrating because there are so many things we could be doing. 
that we have we have a lot of capability today and if we actually applied ourselves we might stand to learn something like we we, we could not only move closer towards solving some of these mysteries but we might actually stand to learn something that benefits us uh, and you know, slowly, slowly, I'm we we we're, we're doing a few of those things ourselves when we go to Egypt, and 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 I'm, and outside of of Egypt, um, I've got a few interesting things happening that um, that could hopefully peel back a few layers of the onion on in terms of precision and machining and 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 the defining the degree of of precision and technology that may have been used to create some of these artifacts. So there's some interesting work happening outside of Egypt, and. Yeah, it's kind of sad that nobody's allowed to analyze these artifacts. Nobody's really allowed to go in and do any work or do any experiments. And many of them would be completely benign. Like, they're not going to hurt anything. Uh, things like scanning with the high-definition, you know, LiDAR scanners, not the, the iPad versions that we use uh, here and there, but, you know, actually doing, like, detailed scans. There's, there's endless uses for robotics to explore lots of different aspects uh we've got all sorts of full spectrum tools that we could be using to analyze uh, some of these things uh holistically as well and uh yeah i i that's what i hope we can we can get to to try and uncover that 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 space and just be open to these ideas like resonance um and not just dismiss them out of hand because yeah as you said I, I think i think it's part of the toolkit i don't think it's an accident that that those we find those properties in places like the great pyramid or in these chambers beneath the giza plateau hmm? i was as you were sharing i was remembering inside the great pyramid uh i think most people call it the antechamber right before you go into the king's chamber that space mm -hmm. that was my favorite part of going inside the great pyramid was seeing this little space you know mm -hmm. if i remember right you crouch under to get in it yeah stand up you stand up and it's it's like you're in a machine, you know, the way the grooves come down. Anything you want to share about that specific piece of the Great Pyramid? Well, yeah, that's typically called part of this whole portcullis mechanism, which I'm not convinced that's what it is. Um, but yeah, and I just, all I can say is, yeah, it's that's a, that's an amazingly resonant space. And just while I was in there, you know, last, what, in November, yeah, I was I was toning. I can hit the tone in there to make it resonate. And um, yeah, I took a couple of people in there, and it just it blows your mind when you get in there and you and you do that. It's it's an it's a very interesting little space. There is, you know, there is a there is a good history and a a, a good there's there were more stones and there was more stuff involved with that area. And there's a good channel out there called History for Granite. Um, I, I know I know that guy as well. Uh, that does explore kind of the history of some of the the granite blocks that were potentially part of that because they were all busted up and then you know sh moved and thrown down the, the the well shaft down into the um the uh the grotto and there's there's blocks of granite here and there around the the great pyramid that have these big tube drills in them that were potentially part of that mechanism so it certainly bears further investigation there was something else going on there like there's there a you know there seems to have been some sort of overpressure event in in the whole king's chamber that affected that just going in there you can see how the granite changes color as you go around the corner from red to kind of black it's almost been burned uh, and there is some evidence that that whole chamber has been expanded like the best part of an inch in all in, in you know all of the walls but um yeah i don't know it's it's i don't have much to say about the the antechamber other than yeah it's, it's incredible and if ever you get in there then then that's one of the most resonant spaces you'll ever be in and it's just when you you hit that tone in there you just feel it vibrating in your chest there's a it's it's quite an experience yeah well uh ben thanks so much for your time today this has been a fascinating interview in closing um is there any projects you're working on you want people to know about and how can they best connect with you follow you in your research cheers derek yeah uh but if anyone wants to check out my work it's youtube.com slash c slash uncharted x i post everything on my website uh, unchartedx.com i'm uncharted x1 on twitter and uncharted x7 on instagram Awesome, man. Well, uh, thank you so much, and hopefully we'll do this again in the, in the near future. Derek, it's been a pleasure, mate. Thanks for having me.